Good afternoon, everyone. Um, all right, I want to start with the midterm that is happening uh, next next week, next Wednesday. Um, it's going to be in person here at the usual time and place. Uh, questions you'll get will be about anything that we have covered in course so far. And then the final exam will cover the second part of the course. Um, you don't need to go over the reading materials that I am uh, sharing with you. I will use just the lectures, meaning the recordings and the slides to uh, design the questions. Um, so that's your main materials. If you're thinking of how to prepare for the exam, the best way is to go over the slides once again. Um, the questions will be multiple choice choice questions, uh, there will might be more than one correct answer, and uh, you are not getting only points for picking the right answers, but also you need to not select the wrong answers. So if you select wrong answers, um, let's say we have two correct answers and you have selected uh, one correct and one incorrect, uh, you get penalized for that incorrect one. I won't tell you on the exam how many there are correct. Like you need to figure that on your own when you read the question. Um, you can bring one paper, both sides with your notes. These notes can be created in any way you like. You can handwrite them. You can write them on your, type them on your computer and print them. You can choose any font you like. Uh, if it's like my tiny, I don't care if you can read it. That's fine with me. Um, you will need to bring your ID. We are going to check your IDs when you submit your uh your uh, exams. So make sure you bring one. And uh, we will also ask you to submit that pa page uh, of the notes uh, with your exam if you if you have notes. Okay, so next week on Monday, uh, I will give a broad overview of what we talked about just to kind of remind our soul like about the topics we covered. This is not going to obviously be then super comprehensive overview because we are going to cram the whole contents of the like half of a semester in a single lecture. So don't uh, think about the overview. Okay, this is this is the only lecture I need to uh, go back to for as a preparation for the exam. Um, I made this Google form, it's anonymous and you can submit your specific questions about the content of the course and that uh, can help me understand, okay, which parts are maybe still unclear and I can focus on covering those parts. So this is your opportunity to kind of dictate what we are talking about on Monday. Uh, that said, those need to be specific questions. If you ask me, hey, can you explain Transformer again? That took like two lectures. Obviously, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. So uh, be mindful of how concrete your questions are. Okay, so that's all I have to say about this midterm exam. Are there any questions on your side? The, the exam is still very much in, in process, so there isn't like the final final thing, uh, so bear that in mind as well. Yes, please. Uh, will the midterm cover like, everything that we've gone over up until that point, the stuff that we've over today? Yes, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. How about that um, penalty for mm -hmm. like, draw out, does it? Carried over the other, like total score, just for that question. Um, let's say I don't get the difference. Sorry. <laughs> um, let's say if the question is two points, uh -huh. uh, and there's two correct answers, and mm -hmm. I think I should like like four, like two wrong answers. Mm -hmm. Do you get like negative or just go to that? Uh, I see. Okay, so um, it's it's more like counting the um. Let's say we have four choices and uh, let's say uh, each choice then can give you 0.25 point, uh, yeah, 0 0.25 points. Then, um, you you know, if you didn't get the that answer choice decision right, you get a zero. So um, you can get either zero on, on a given question or one, for example. So no, it's more like counting points that determines your total score rather than you start with the you know to total number and then I'm deducting if that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Are all the questions multiple choice like that? Yeah, so for midterm I will have only multiple choice. Uh, and then for a final exam, uh, I might have multiple choice with some like short answers. But for a midterm, only multiple choice, yeah. 
Okay, very well. Uh, so let's then continue. All right, so what I want to talk uh, about today, I first had the idea I want to cover some applications we haven't talked about, which I will come to at some point, like summarization and dialogue and relation extraction, whatnot. Um, but thinking about applications made me think about um, tasks. And um, let, let me clarify. So um, in when we started this course, I told you there are these two major goals in the NLP community. One of them is to build uh, computational models that enable certain applications. And the other goal was to use computational methods to understand human language, which we didn't really talk much about. Uh, so in the... One of these goals, the building of the applications, applications we have, you know, we we kind of strive to make is to translate text from one language to another, summarize or one or more documents in a few paragraphs or in a structured table, answer questions using information in one or more documents, engage in a conversation with a person, and follow any instructions they give. So these are all kinds of like applications we have in mind in the NLP uh, community. However, now I think you all have experience with your homework is how many decisions you need to make for a given, you know, model. Even if you are given a concrete data and evaluation metrics, there are all these decisions that one needs to make. Um, so when, when one decides to tackle new application, there are so many questions to the point that you can decide, well, the desire system, let's say for machine translation, if you were doing it 10 years ago, to just translate from any language to any language, uh, is just impossible yet. And therefore we just give up and we don't do it, which is obviously not a thing we are doing uh, in engineering uh, fields. What we do instead is define and tackle so-called tasks, which are these versions of these applications that are that abstract away some details um, and make some simplifying uh, assumptions. So you're like, okay, I really want to have this high level futuristic idea, but that futuristic idea uh, with the given tools I have right now is simply, it's just too far away, right? Like you can't imagine tackling it right now. You are missing like major things. So what you do instead is say, okay, from this application, I'm going to define a task. And this task will introduce some simplifications. For example, in machine translation, you might assume that the input text will be in one of a, or a small set of languages. In the beginning, I told you that there are over 7,000 languages in the world, and that right now the NLP community is focusing on 100 of them. So a very small fraction of the older languages in the world. So we assume when we do machine translation research is, okay, we are not gonna focus on all 7,000 languages. Instead, we are going to uh, you know, focus on a small set that for which we likely have uh, data and resources. Um, and we are going to format it according to something like newspaper-like writing conventions. Like we are not going to deal uh, with any kinds of text immediately. We might not want to deal with tweets, for example, we will, focused on more standardized, langu uh, standardized language uh, like the one in uh, newspaper. Um, same for the output text. And, you know, we won't assume that we are translating text from a domain like news into a domain like uh, a tweet. Text will be, um, the text we are going to translate are going to be relatively short. So uh, instead of providing an entire huge document, although now this is a research direction, um, we will typically assume in machine translation that our inputs are relatively short. And uh, the whole segment will be the source, will be available during the translation. We are not going to assume that the uh, source is coming on fly, and as the source is coming, we are translating, which happens with the live translation, uh, which you certainly have seen in live broadcasts. So this is not something we would assume in machine uh, uh, translation research. And other research will make different assumptions. So although, you know, you might be a machine translation researcher and I might be a machine translation researcher, we might define tasks within the realm of machine translation application that make different assumptions and therefore are different tasks within this uh, space. So the task, one application can have multiple tasks in both industry and in uh, research. Okay, so what makes a task? Um, 
I like this definition. I already gave you one like description of what the task is, but I like this one to, to you know, to uh, the term that refers to a specification of certain components of an NLP system, most notably data and evaluation. So data, uh, with, by data, we um, set a set of realistic demonstrations of possible input uh, inputs paired with the desired out outputs. So we, um, we collect these inputs outputs, but by collecting them, we also make a lot of decisions about the format, about the domain of this data, about uh, how the long the sequences are, are gonna be and so many other things. So you are collecting the data and through the data collection, you make a lot of assumptions about the type of system you are building. With the, with the data comes the evaluation. Uh, there's a measurement uh, that in a quantitative and reproducible way, although with you know, uh, human evaluation that becomes a little bit trickier, tells us how well the system's output matches the desired output. And for example, uh, uh, for the task you all worked on, for sentiment classification, the overall goal was bigger than just binary sentiment classification. It was the determining sentiment expressed in text. And we, from that aspiration, had determined the task, which is narrower. It is just a binary sentiment classification, meaning from a given piece of text, you are giving either positive or a negative label. But um, exp you know, determining expression of sentiment is way richer than just these binary labels. We have used the sentiments, uh, Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank or SST2 data set that uh, has inputs are full sentence sentences that are actually derived from another data set that was introduced in uh, Peng and Lee. So from a full review, they extracted these full sentences and then they labeled each one of these sentences. So you get the sentence level binary sentiment classification. You see how I'm like adding more modifiers to our classification task, which kind of shows how many assumptions we have made in the process. Um, we have also here in this data set, the labels are crowdsourced from uh, people have told, okay, these are the labels and they actually uh, chosen five possible labels that are not only positive or negative, but uh, very positive or somewhat positive. And then all these labels, as long as they are at least a little bit positive, were turned into a positive label. So um, we in this task, we are also simplifying this notion of strength of the sentiment expressed, right? We don't care about it. Where in reality, as someone might say, you know, you might be recommending a movie to someone. And they might ask you, well, why are you recommending this movie? And you might say, well, I read this review and it was really, you know, like really was positive about this movie. Or you might like, oh, we might watch this movie. I read the review. It's kind of like positive, but yeah, it might be, you know, we might choose another one. So you, you in the real world, you are interested in more uh, fine grainer labels than we have actually tackled. <laughs> and our evaluation was accuracy, the percentage of correctly predicted, we have also been outputting precision and recall F F1 score. We already know that there isn't just a one way to measure it, right? So uh, the evaluation is also a choice we are making here. Now we have task. Task is defined by data and evaluation. You will also hear this term benchmark. What is the difference between benchmark and a task is really, um, it's really subtle, I would say. So the benchmark instantiates certain task we have defined and uh, with a specific format. And um, so um, we didn't really talk much about that, but you can approach um, something like sentence classification, but we could have approached question answering, uh, excuse me, sentiment classification as a question answering format where, and we did that somewhat with prompting. Remember when we ask, what is the uh, sentiment of this review? And the answers are always either positive or negative, which is, uh, the reason why people call this QA format, not QA task, which is a whole other <laughs> discussion we could be having. So you, def you, you say we are going to do this task and we are going to approach it in this way. You know, when we approached a problem in a sequence to sequence manner, that was also us specifying the format of the task. We are going to have some data and this data will have input and outputs. And we said with, through, through collection of this data, we are certainly making assumptions 
of what we are addressing with this task. It's very hard to collect data that's extremely comprehensive and that covers all your bases. We will have an evaluation metric that we deem can evaluate progress on this task. And we, here is, I would say, where benchmarks kind of also differ from the tasks themselves. You are also introducing some baseline results. Usually, if you are creating a benchmark, you're going to take the state-of-the-art approach. For example, now that we heard, learned about language, large language models, can someone tell me what kind of baseline uh, state-of-the-art result in within the open source community we could um, present if we are now presenting a new benchmark for binary sentiment classification? Yeah, Bert? Can we do better? Bert was released in 2018. <laughs> there is a Bert theory. Uh, yeah. The Berta version three is one uh, one choice. Uh, if we approach it as the using encoder only model uh, and um, as, a, as a classification, what else we, we could try? This is a little, we are getting into, let's remind ourselves what we learned in the course as well. Just some other option. The Berta version three is completely reasonable. Llama, okay. Are we going to fine tune this model or not? Why not? Yeah, that's a good point. Will it though? Uh, it depends, I think, on whether your data, the one we are now introducing, is sufficiently different than what has been used for instruction fine tuning. So yeah, I do agree if the data is very alike, our prompting approach and our fine tuning approach might be very alike. But most likely we are introducing a new benchmark because this is a new task that we deem is like not, it doesn't exist uh, yet which would mean uh, likely that fine tuning might be helpful because uh, we, uh, we you know, fine tuning is just seeing more of the data and therefore it usually helps. So we might actually do both. People are interested both in what is this, you know, baseline results if we are tackling this as a fine tuning, you know, approach or what is the state of the art if we are just prompting the model. So you might uh, introduce these are our best zero shot results, our best few shot results, and our best fine tune uh, fine tuned approach. And yes, using Llama 2 and fine tuning it uh, would likely be the, the best, uh, you know, the, the most, the strongest baseline um, that many people can actually um, uh, run on their own compute. So that would be an excellent choice. So these are like state of the art results and very common what happens is people introduce baselines that are too weak or compared to too weak baselines, uh, which means that if you are now introducing something new and you're saying I'm, I'm the way we, we demonstrate in research that we our new component is beneficial is to compare it to the baseline. Uh, compare your results with the baseline results. And then if the difference is significant, we say, well, this is this is novel and this is what people should be using. But if you use a baseline that's too weak, then that's easy to beat, right? So uh, when you are writing research and you know for your projects, you should always choose a baseline that um, most people will say, yeah, that's a strong, reasonable choice uh, for, for, you know, for the task. Of course, Baselines depend on the compute we have. And uh, if you can narrow your task even further by saying, okay, we, we care about um, this task in the realm of like efficient models or something. So we don't care about these huge models in this task. And therefore your baseline can be something that smaller model, not Lama 7 billion. There are also heuristic baselines. These baselines are, for example, if you have a classification, uh, we mentioned this in homework. So you have binary classification and you have balanced training data set. That means your a random baseline, the baseline that will assign labels randomly should be around 50% uh, if uh, both of these are equally possible. And this is, a, this is a great baseline to always have. Like you should always be better than random. If not, then that's very, very bad. 
Um, and then there are other heuristics that I will talk about. Majority vote is another one if you have uh, labels that are not balanced in the training data. Um, so there um, it might be higher just because picking a certain label uh, that's very well presented might give you very high performance. So using both of these is important if you are introducing uh, a benchmark. And when you introduce the benchmark, the idea is that other people will use this exact setup and then they are going to compare to each other. And by you know uh, having this more reproducible way of comparing to each other that's more objective, then you get uh, progress on this task faster. So very often benchmarks will also be, um, um, they come together with the so-called leader leaderboards where you have a web page and you can see how the, um, how the performance uh, changes over time. Okay, so progress on to harder problems uh, is claimed to be achieved if a new system works well and relies on fewer assumptions. So very often people will start with like, this is what we can tackle right now. And even with all these assumptions, we still can't, you know, our performance is not amazing. And then People work, 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 work on it, and then suddenly we reach the performance that's high. Uh, usually, whether the performance is high enough is determined by um, comparing to so-called human performance, where you ask some annotators to do this task for you, and then you estimate human performance. Not always people will have 100% on the task, so that's why this step is important to not penalize more or if your human performance is 90%, this 90 to 100% is very often deemed noise. And that's why people can't really agree on what's going on in those last 10%. So if you reach 90%, you don't want to do research to meet 100% because that's likely not meaningful in any proper way. Probably you are modeling something that is not um, reliable. So once the human performance is reached, People say benchmark has been sold and or your you know performance has saturated and people move on to a version of a task with less assumptions. Um, I do want to warn you that our and that's what we are going to talk about right now. This also assumes that benchmarks are valid, right? So if your benchmark um, what can happen, and you're probably not aware of it, is that models that do things in a very silly way and not how you intended can reach very high performance on this benchmark. And then the progress hasn't actually been made. You just build a system that gamifies your benchmark. And that's the topic of the today's lecture. We'll see how that can be happening. But I do want to kind of um, point to these two papers um, that discuss uh, what does it what what is progress? And if we if we deem that higher performance on these benchmarks and solving these benchmarks is uh, progress, then what are we progressing to exactly? Are some like more conceptual questions that you couldn't be thinking of. So if you are interested to learn a little bit more about this, I highly recommend these two papers. However, I want to go back to what I said. Like we are we should as ideally our benchmarks are valid, whatever that means right now. For a moment, think about it as valid means that high performance on this uh, benchmark means that your model, the best model uh, on this benchmark is truly, truly mm, achieving something more powerful than the, the other models. And we have actually made the progress. And in 2018, around 2018, when BERT came out and when, when we get this huge massive improvements that I mentioned in a lot of existing benchmarks, uh, such as, uh, for example, uh, translation, or here, a task of reading comprehension that we mentioned, where you answer a question given a piece of uh, other text. Uh, so what happened is a lot of these uh, BERT models have achieved human performance on this benchmark. And then you had these kinds of he headlines that were really, you know, uh, blew things out of proportion. They are like achieving human parity on, you know, machine on, on, on translation. Microsoft creates AI that can read the document and answer questions about it as well as a person. Um, this is why it's important to understand the difference between a benchmark and the application, the difference between a task and the application. 
we in our community, in our NLP community, when this happened, when uh, the data set that has been used here is called squad and it was mass massively important. When this was reached, we all knew what happened. We knew, aha, that task has been solved with those sets of assumptions in that specific data. But no one was thinking we have now reached AI that can read and reason and answer questions as good as a person. However, if you do not know what you're reaching human performance on a given benchmark means, you might have write a title like this, where you claim that we have reached a human level of, you know, question answering, which would be like a holy grail of AI. It would make basically mean, you know, in the first lecture, I mentioned what are the goals of the AI that have been set in the 1950s. That would mean, okay, we we did it. It's done. We all go home. We, we, we sold everything. And um, the difference between 2018 models and uh, 2023 models is so huge. Like the progress, the, so much more progress has uh, has been made after. So yeah, whenever you see titles like these and your friends start to tell you, do you know that AI can do something blah as good as you? You can tell them, well, it actually sold the benchmark, not, not the application. Okay, but let's see how, how uh, models can easily so benchmarks in ways we don't intend. There is this um, very important concept called data shortcut or data artifact or spurious correlation in the data. I will give you an example where um, these data artifacts have been um, not necessarily discovered for the first time, but the result that made it super prominent and made it um, whole community think about this issue a lot. So after this work, this became a big research direction in the NLP community, how to discover and mitigate these data artifacts. I didn't explain what data shortcut or artifact is uh, yet, so give, let me give you an example. Uh, this task is called natural language inference, a very common task for natural language understanding in NLP that has been very popular in the around 2018. Um, and in the specific data set for that task, um, SNLI, you have to, given a sentence, which is called a premise, determine whether the other sentence called hypothesis is true, false, or neither, or in other words, entailed, contradicted, or neutral, given this premise, just by based on this premise. So for example, here premises three dogs racing on racetrack, and we have this hypothesis, three cats race uh, on, a race, on a track. So we say this is a contradiction because dogs are racing on a, a racetrack, not cats. So that's the task. And if you achieved very high performance on this task, it uh, was a sign that your um, model understand the meaning of sentences way better than other models. However, what these researchers have discovered is they train one of these, uh, what we also call heuristic baselines. It's a version of the task uh, that you try that makes no sense intentionally. So here what they did is they, is they say, well, this is a classification of relationship of the two sentences, right? Uh, so you should not be able to determine the relationship of two sentences if you never give a person one of these sentences, right? It makes this task to completely stupid and completely like bogus. It doesn't make any sense. So if your model can solve the task in this fashion, that means that your data is not uh, is is broken. So what they did is instead of taking two of these sequences, they took only one hypothesis and they trained the model to predict the label from hypothesis only. So just to repeat it, they are trying to predict the relationship of two sequences without ever giving one of these two sequences. The performance should be random, right? However, performance here is super high, meaning that there is something in these hypothesis sentences, we would say that leaks the label, or it's a shortcut to the label, or is a spurious correlation to the label, or is an artifact. So they discovered that, and then that showed that you can achieve very high performance for bad reasons. Um, so you will hear this phrase a lot, like, is your model 
good for the right reasons. And determining whether that's really the case, it's really hard. Uh, this baseline I have just described to you where we train only with hypothesis sentence is called hypothesis only baseline. And since they have introduced it, it became one of the things people do when they introduce a new data set. So for example, I have created new data sets. Uh, these are question answering reading comprehension data sets. And we would try to do something um, again, silly, try to um, <clears throat> answer the question based only on certain phrase in this question. It shouldn't be possible because you need way more information. And then if you're not able to do that, you can say, well, at least we know that there aren't these uh, obvious data shortcuts in our data, but you don't have like guarantee that your data is without these shortcuts. So hypothesis only baseline had introduced a lot of these kinds of baselines later on. Um, going back to this example and uh, what has happened here. It, what has happened here and is that the creators of this data set called SNLI uh, have um, collected the, these sentences by taking um, a data set from computer vision for image captioning. So there is an image and there is a caption and they said, we'll use all of these captions um, as our premise sentences. And they instructed their annotators to produce a hypothesis sentence that either contradicts or is entailed or is neutral by this premise. Well, what happens is that computer vision data sets themselves have data artifacts. Namely, a lot of vision data sets have a lot of images of dogs. Um, so I don't know, have you ever seen that, uh, like whatever they are called, um, visualizations of activations that look very, you know, kind of like uh, hallucinations. One of them is on the deep learning book. If you do that, there are a lot of uh, these uh, kind of show dogs because dogs are so well <laughs> represented in activations of uh, computer vision models. So a lot of these premises have dogs, uh, word dogs in, in them. Annotators, they are incentivized by solving as, uh, you know, producing as many of your, these sentences in the sh shortest time possible such that they get, uh, Money, of course, the, that's their incentive. So what they realized is, uh huh, to just produce contradiction, I need to chain dogs to cats. So they deployed this pattern, they realized, and that's way easier than writing a lot of hypothesis sentences from scratch. So a lot of these contradiction examples have cats in the hypothesis sentence. And the model, as soon as it sees cats, it decides this is contradiction, and because we have this spurious correlation for um, many of these examples is going to be correct. So to bring you a definition, an input feature for us in a natural language processing feature is usually a token, right? Or a word. It is an artifact if there exists a correlation between a task label, here labels are contradiction, neutral or entailed, and the feature in the training data, we have just seen there is a, a correlation between the word cats and the label contradiction, but it doesn't exist in the task we would actually like to learn. So if you're teaching a human, hey, can you do uh, this task for me? You will, among your instructions, there wouldn't be an instruction. And if you see a word cat, you better give contradiction because that doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't have anything to do with the task. So it is a spurious correlation in a sense that exists only in our training data. All right, so let me see where I'm going with that. Um, okay, so this is just a, a little visualization of how, what happens with this systemic, you know, using of patterns by annotators. This visualization, it represents a binary classification task, orange is one label, blue is the other. And to actually learn the decision boundary that is good for this task, you need to learn something that looks like this, which is quite complex, right? And these points represents if we were able to actually have the exact distribution of the data in the real world, this is how the uh, distribution of the data would look like. However, when people use this, uh, you know, uh, systemic annotation biases, uh, what we introduce are these systemic gaps. Um, so your very complex problem turns into something that's super simple. And then a super simple model, like the hypothesis only baseline, can solve the task, right? 
Okay, so we'll come back to this visualization later on how to you know mitigate or how to evaluate models more robustly that just admits that there might be data set biases and that we can't do super formal guarantees that the data shortcuts are that there isn't any single one of them anymore. Okay, so the type of artifact that I have shown you with cats, that's called um, a granule input feature uh, because it refers to discrete units such as individual word. Um, more difficult to capture biases are those that refer to abstract features. So another uh, another data shortcuts the same authors have um, introduced uh, have uh, identified is um, the following. If there is a high lexical overlap between your premise and hypothesis, meaning if there are many shared words between premise and hypothesis, that's going to be entailment, likely going to be entailment in this data set. Uh, not necessarily true for every single instance of this task in the real world. So the model doesn't need to read this, any of this work. It just needs to count the overlap. And if the overlap is sufficiently high, it may decide this is entailment. And these kinds of biases are way harder to capture because there isn't like corpus statistic here that can help you out. Um, uh, yeah, in, in, in the granular input features, you can kind of measure how many times certain words have, a, a, you know, uh, appear uh, and whether it's too suspicious that they are appearing rel more relative to the others. So abstract input features are really, really, really hard to capture. So we this issue of producing benchmarks where your training data doesn't have any of these data shortcuts or artifacts or conspiracy correlations is actually extremely hard. And there isn't so far like an off-shell technique that you can use that tells you your data set is free of the of the of the shortcuts. And that's really also really important when you are interpreting these results. When you get this superhuman performance, it still might be because the model just have learned silly patterns in the data, not because the model is now achieving ability to reason and understand. And that's why the question of do models reason and understand is also very complex. It's not something we can address completely by producing good benchmarks and measuring progress on them. It doesn't, solving that benchmarks doesn't then confirm, yes, indeed, you now have a model that can uh, reason and understand. So, you know, if you think, well, if the data shortcuts are a problem, then just produce data without data shortcuts, that's not really a solution because that's really hard to achieve. Um, so how people then deal with us? Uh, and I would say there are two like different worldviews in the NLP community. On one say, uh, when you know when we talk about how to collect the data for measuring progress on tasks. Uh, on one, on one hand, we have people who want to have strict qualifications for their annotators, and that means that they're gonna recruit less annotators. Um, there's uh, developers of the data will iteratively review the data. So as the data comes, they will look into and inspect whether use some you know statistics uh, to see whether they deem that some patterns are overused. And then if they deem they are, they are going to provide personalized feedback. They are going to say their annotators, hey, great job on you know producing these examples. We love that, but we have enough of that. So now please uh, make sure that you are not, you know, producing examples that are in a, in a similar spirit. And if you know, if they will monitor what these annotators are doing, and if the annotators are not really receptive to the feedbacks, they will say, well, thank you for you know working for us, uh, that we, we had uh, enough from you. And uh, if they, on the other hand, are very receptive to the feedback, you might give bonuses and so on. But it requires that you actually look into the data as data is coming and make these decisions. On the other hand, um, what will happen with this is, is that you're going to have smaller coverage for sure, and but better quality of the data. Now, on the other hand, we have people who 
uh, say, well, no, no, we need many annotators. We need fast uh, annotation turnaround. We need bigger coverage because in the end, coverage is really important. As we said, like we have application and task. We don't want to go too, too you know, narrow and have a very specialized task. We care about the application, so we have want to have a lot of diversity and good coverage of the examples we are covering in our data. So they say, well, we need this, but we are aware that we might be introducing data that's of insufficient quality. However, instead of you know ditching this approach we are going to introduce methods that then filter out this data into smaller data that's of better quality. So people first have deployed so-called model in the loop, where you take the model, which is a reasonable strong baseline today, like fine-tuned LAMA 7 billion, and uh, you annotate data. And uh, if the annotator, annotator submits their data, and then you check what the uh, model does with that uh, instance. And if it solved it, you say, well, I don't like this example. Can you produce, can you produce uh, example, labeled example where the model breaks? So you produce examples that are almost like adversarial to your reasonably strong baseline today. And the issue with this is that um, the, the issue that people brought up with this approach is that now you're introducing these examples that are somewhat artificial as well, because you are bending them, you know, you know, in a way that breaks the model. It's not the first idea you had in mind, the most natural uh, to you. Um, another thing people have done is uh, use this uh, methodology, which is broader than just for data annotation, called dataset cartography, where you are training again a reasonable uh, model, you know, a baseline, and while you are training on the data you have, uh, you are measuring the confidence of the model in the in the certain data instances. You are measuring how much the model. Uh, across epochs changes is prediction for those instances. And then uh, you use the confidence and variability to make this 2D plot of your data. So those examples where the model is highly confident and never changes its labels, you say these are easy to learn. For example, where the model is neither, like it, it's not confident, but it doesn't change its, la its uh, label. It's like, this is my best guess and I'm gonna stick with it. That's the examples that are hard to learn. And then you have examples that, you know, the, the, the confidence is not uh, either high or, uh, or low, and the variability uh, is, again, somewhere in between. And those are examples that are labeled as ambiguous to the model. And they are often ambiguous because they are ambiguous even to people, despite us forcing people to you know, like usually when people annotate data, they have three annotators and then they take the majority vote of the ground tr truth. But in this way, you just ignore that there was a disagreement between them. So um, you can use this to collect data by uh, similar to how people have produced uh, this uh, WNLI uh, data set where I taking the data set, you know, it's uh, potentially uh, full of artifacts like SNLI. You do this data set cartography thing, you find hard to learn examples, and then you use those examples to show a great text generator model or a human. Uh, hey, these are the examples I want to have in my data. Can you produce more examples in this fashion? And in for WNLI, they did it with a GPT model, where the GPT model had then generated more of these alike, which is in itself, like you do need to extra step of checking what the generations are because, um, yeah, again, a GPT four could deploy um, patterns it, it has discovered for creating data. In any case, I wanted to show that there are these two separated views, and I would say I personally had embraced more of this uh, view uh, in my own uh, work, and I would say now that we have this, you know, weird situation where we have in-context learning and we are not changing the model weights very often, 
uh, there is less training of the models for you know certain things. Uh, then what we care about is actually evaluation if you don't train the model. So you don't need the training data. And if you don't need training data, then the coverage, a small, small size is totally acceptable. Like having a few hundreds or thousand examples for your evaluation is totally reasonable. So if it's reasonable to have a small data set to begin with, then um, yeah, like you don't need to uh, over, over sample them down sample basically. Um, that said, you know, when people create only evaluation, evaluation uh, data, then uh, and then they show okay this data is hard a common question they will get well can we fix this by having more data to train this model so it's way better if you're writing a paper where you have both training and evaluation data and you show that just by fine-tuning the model on this uh, phenomenon you can't really um, solve get a human level of performance that shows that uh, you have created um, an instance of uh, of uh, you know some pheno you are kind of producing some task that needs more creative approaches than what's already available in the community. Okay, any question about the data artifacts, data annotation? Okay, so we have learned that we want to produce benchmarks that show progress. Uh, those benchmarks should be constructed such that improvements on the benchmarks mean that you have a model that reasons about the language better, not a model that finds patterns in the data better, you know, spurious patterns that then over you you know overuses these patterns and gets the better performance. These patterns, spurious patterns, we call data shortcuts or data artifacts. And we have talked about two ways that you can annotate data that maybe reduces the artifacts you get. Um, I want to now go back to that illustrations I have shown you. So this was the illustration of the phenomena like presentation of the real data of the phenomena and how complex the decision has to be. Then we said, okay, our annotators have used some uh, patterns and we have introduced systemic uh, biases. So uh, from the all the instances in our possible you know, data, uh, we have sampled these instances, but these instances are easily separable. In this paper by Gardner et al, they have introduced this idea that, okay, maybe there are some, uh, maybe we first have sampled data that is, uh, you know, doesn't represent the true distribution of the data, but filling in all these gaps is simply impossible. It is impossible to get the data that fully represents, like for example, for machine translation, uh, all possible, uh, translation pairs we can think of in the world. It's just impossible to do that, even if you make some uh, simplifying assumptions. So we can't really fill in all the gaps, but for the data we have sampled, we can fill the gaps around its uh, neighborhood. So basically you have these uh, examples and then you find uh, minimally different examples that may or may not have the same label. And usually you want to, them to to have some that do not have the same label, so you cross this uh, decision boundary. And then you are going to evaluate whether the model is good in these for all of the instances in the boundary. And if not, that suggests that it doesn't really uh, do the task very well. So let me show you an example. This is again, I've shown you this example before. It is a reading comprehension uh, uh, data set. Here, we are gonna make few to make like a minimally different examples, we are going to make uh, edits of this passage. So this passage says um, the, the, the most important sentence is nearly all of his possessions were destroyed with the exception of a guitar and the prized Jaguar automobile. 
Uh, this, this data set is designed to check whether models can reason about implications of negations. So negation here is the with the exception of. So we want to make minimal difference, but uh, minimally different examples, but we also want to make the edits that go along certain dimensions to, to have a, a bigger coverage of linguistic phenomenon related to this bigger phenomenon of negation. So these minimally different instances are produced by paraphrasing the negation. So uh, here, instead of saying with the exception, we say, but a guitar and a prized uh, automobile survived. We change the scope by scope is what is being uh, negated here. So instead of uh, having a uh, uh, guitar and the car being you know, exception, we have only the car being the exception, but guitar was destroyed in this case. And here we have um, undoing of the negation. So now we have that like, you know, going across the boundary. So instead of with the exception of, we write including. Important is whatever we see here, like what's crossed and then what's in bold, these are these, these changes that have happened in this paragraph. So the changes are very small, right? So if we ask a question here, was this person able to use his uh, car after the fire? If you have been able to answer this question, uh, the, this question in the context of the original paragraph, well, if you have true abilities to reason and understand language, then answering these, uh, the same question with uh, in the context of these paragraphs will possess no problems for you. Like you will have no problem answering uh, these uh, the, the same question in the context of this other minimally different uh, passages. So that's the idea. Like you are, you know, staying in this uh, neighborhood and uh, all, if you truly understand answering of this question, you should be able to do it in the context of all of these minimally different passages. Uh, another thing to uh, what we have done here is to kind of avoid the problem of data artifacts in the context of reading comprehension data sets. These models, powerful models we have right now, they're really good at matching text. So if your question uh, has a lot of overlap, again, with your uh, passage, it can find, uh, just localize where that, you know, uh, um, where the information that's relevant for answering this question is within the passage. And it can quickly find the answer if the answer doesn't require any reasoning steps that are not explicit in the passage. So what we've done here is to kind of avoid that, is ask the questions that are about the implication of, um, of the text that's uh, in, presented in the passage, rather than something that's explicitly mentioned uh, in the passage. So that's a little side, like, you know, side point, uh, kind of also speaking of how when you design this data, how you need to think about everything you know about how these models can use these data shortcuts. And then instead of, um, you know, uh, checking whether your model is good, whether it can answer this question with this uh, passage, you care about whether it can answer all of these questions within all of these uh, uh, passages. And that gives you way better understanding of whether this model can answer or, you know, can it really reason about uh, this particular, you know, information we are seeking here. More concretely, um, so um, when we, when we you know, we can use accuracy for this data set. So here I'm just illustrating a situation where our evaluation data consists of these, um, how many we have here, one, two, three, uh, we have 36, right? Um, I think so, or more. Okay, so we have uh, 36 of uh, question answer pairs here. And um, if we, you know, I assign these uh, check marks randomly and uh, let's say um, here the model had correctly answered 25 of them. Then you will calculate the accuracy. Accuracy is 25 over 36, it's 70%. How do we feel about the model that's 70% accurate? Not, not, not happy? <laughs> Let's say random baseline is 20%. It's not really, it's like 50, 50%. 
are we terribly disappointed in our model? Not really, some are, okay. But at least some of you are not terribly disappointed. So now going back to that, you need to be correct in these uh, the, you know, minimally different groups of examples. That would mean that uh, if we group these like this, so um, uh, these would be, each one of these is exactly what I had previously where I had all those questions and all those passages. And imagine that the model is correct only for one of these, then it's consistency, that's the measure we are measuring here, how many fully correctly answered bundles we have among all of these bundles of instances would be only 33% which is quite low. And in this data set specifically, um, you will have human consistency being almost 90% and then human accuracy being over 90%. And at the time, which was like instruct GPT, we had uh, 30 something percent consistency. And to this day, GPT-4 is also still around 30 something percent uh, relative to uh, humans that have 80 something percent. So. This, this, this measurement tells us way more about uh, how these models actually reason about these instances than these uh, accuracies alone. Um, and in the recent paper, we have evaluated this with, for example, Flanty5, and there are other data sets. This, uh, this one is called ConvaQAid that I have been showing you. There are other uh, data sets like these that are called contrastive data sets or contrast uh, sets. There, you, you know, I'm, I won't go over all of these bars over here. What I wanna show you maybe are two pieces of information. This is task performance, uh, like accuracy, for example. And you can see how accuracy can drop from, to this date, from 80 something percent to only 42 of uh, consistency. That's one thing to remember. And then uh, remember that these consistency values are still rather low, except here, maybe IMDB. Um, uh, Conda QA is the only one for which we have human consistency. So here, uh, human consistency, as I said, is over 80%. So there is a, like a huge gap between what is achievable and what these models can do. So, you know, when people still say, okay, we can reason about this, about text, if that information is based just on the accuracy alone, again, be suspicious because these measurements can't really, you know, fully capture what does it mean to reason about uh, language. However, you know, maybe a higher level point I want to make that connects to data artifacts is that it is impossible to guarantee that there are no data artifacts. So. If you say, if you admit that to yourself um, and you still cared about building systems that are truly do things correctly, um, then using measurements like these is better. It's better to do these more robust evaluations of consistency rather than accuracy alone. You are stuck with the data you have, unfortunately, right? Like we have more of so quote unquote normal data sets uh, than uh, these kinds of data sets uh, that are contra sets, which we have only uh, 11 in total in right now, altogether in the whole NLP. Um, yeah, but, you know, producing more contrastive data, or if you are producing a whole new benchmark that targets another phenomenon, remember that producing contrast version of them might be a great idea. All right, are there any questions about contrasets? Yeah, and here I wrote that the issue, I mean, underlying issue is also uh, this uh, assumption that you all learn in you know, machine learning one-on-one, -on -one, which is the IID assumption that uh, examples are uh, identically and independently distributed and um, they don't need to be independently distributed. So with the contrast sets, we break that assumption. We say we we won't make that assumption and we'll intentionally evaluate examples that depend on each other. And then when you break that assumption and do the evaluation, you can see this massive drops, not just because you, you know, violated the assumption, that's not the point, rather that the assumption is not super realistic. So if you uh, kind of abandon it, you might have more robust evaluations. 
yeah, and I mean the issue right now in NLP that these kinds of evaluations are not uh, not uh, mainstream, so you won't see ton of this, and it takes a lot of you know culture shift to move from, uh, you know, evaluation whatever is the hottest benchmark right now, and just saying okay, I want you know hill climb on that benchmark. I would rather do something uh, more you know robust, and you know I, I'm not saying this as a as a as I'm kind of to say that hill climbing on benchmark is um it just doesn't make sense because that's how we have all these improvements and i think i mentioned it before that it's kind of um dissatisfactory maybe that even though we have hill climbed on the snli that had all these data artifacts it had led to then newer benchmarks better models and so on so even with the benchmarks that are not fully functional the progress has still been made and again it depends on one's definition of progress because some people will still say that chat gpt is not the progress uh we want we want something if you know if your idea of progress is i want to have controllable systems that have the skill set of chat gpt that yeah then we didn't make progress right Okay, um, any questions? Okay. Uh, all right, so one thing I said is that uh, progress means that a new system works well. And I, I wanna touch on that as well. So uh, when you make, um, when we improve on a certain benchmark, so let's say the benchmark is sentiment classification, if your model is now better in accuracy, you would expect it that uh, still it can, whatever the previous model was able to handle, your model still can, model can handle those cases and then some more. Um, however, ensuring that, you know, whatever is the most basic phenomena that we want to be able to handle well, is still remains with, uh, you know, improvements in, um, in the benchmark, that's still not kind of the thing we that's necessarily happening. Um, so in 2020, uh, the best paper in ACL had introduced this methodology called checklist. And checklist is a way to verify that your NLP models possess expected uh, capabilities. Basically, what they do is they introduce this like minimally, you know, functionality tests. Um, these are similar to unit testing that you are all aware of, where you want to check whether your model can handle, you know, uh, simple examples of the phenomena you care about. So, for example, there is a task where you need to determine whether two questions are duplicates of each other. This is important for, for example, search engines. If you can determine that something is a duplicate of the uh, another question you have already answered, you can retrieve that answer or those sets of pages. You don't need to do the further computations. And in this work, they have um, introduced this minimally functionality text uh, also across different aspects of the phenomena, of language phenomena. So for example, uh, you if you are claiming your system uh, for detection of duplicate question is really good, it should, we will probably all agree, it should be able to uh, say that is person X or this person used to be X are the two different questions. For example, is James Russell an actress or did James uh, Russell used to be an actress are not the exact same uh, questions because there is this temporal variation between them. Uh, similarly, uh, another temporal example here, uh, whether something came before or after, not the same, right? Then the task of coreference resolution, we didn't yet uh, talk about coreference resolution, but the task is to determine whether these pronouns, he or she refer to these names of Olivia and Donald. So here uh, we have two uh, questions where uh, we use different pronouns, he or she, and therefore these uh, questions uh, refer, uh, you know, the answer is going to be different because you know who rejected who is not a symmetric um, operation in life uh, very often. Um, similarly, here uh, using a pronoun or spelling out one other person's name, uh, which is not the reference, uh, you know, uh, to this uh, pronoun. 
And then uh, another task is semantic role labeling. Another task we didn't talk about yet, uh, but uh, basically if you um, swap the, whether you use active or passive voice, and then it changes kind of the relationship of the people here. So does Michelle trust Angela or is Michelle trusted by Angela are two different questions. The point here that I'm trying to make, and uh, I think reading all these examples might be <laughs> kind of steering away from my point, is that um, all of these examples are very simple, right? If you claim you have a system that can do identification of two, whether two questions are paraphrases of each other, I think we can all agree that these are simple cases for that model. Do we feel like that? Or some, you know, some of you think this might be like hard? If someone gave you these examples, would you have any issue with them? No. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope so. Um, these these seem pretty, pretty easy cases of determining whether two things are the same. So that's the idea. Like you are want to check whether model can still do this. Like, can it still answer these questions? So here is the accuracy of the models that are trained um, on this uh, data set, QQP. Uh, it's, they are all fine tuned on the training data. You can see that all of them, here we have a Roberta base and then T5 models up to 11 billion. All of them achieve a pretty high accuracy of 90%. This is usually when you reach 90% in NLP, that's the point where you're like, I think this, this is about done. Or there might be still a gap with the human performance, but reaching 90 is pretty, pretty high. So seeing this and having this insight I just told you, you might conclude, okay, this is, these models are pretty good at this task. So now look, look, look into these uh, uh, tests. What happens with these tests is that actually, uh, as we scale the model, and here we have seen that the model are becoming slightly better, not hugely different from each other, but scale did improve uh, a little bit. So what we see here is that it is performance on these tests also improves, but then at some point when we reach the 3 billion model version, the performance drops, drops, drops a lot, drops a little bit, right? So there are suddenly these drops. So what does this mean is that we have trained these models that are slightly better than the, you know, their smaller versions, or they remain similar levels of accuracy, but then they actually break um, their abilities to handle these basic skills that we expect to always be handled, even in these cases where they are super small, which I'd also make a strong point about. This, these accuracies are still pretty high, but these, uh, these accuracies are very low, so that's very bad. So we have improved the model, or we have achieved very high accuracy, but the ability to handle this very simple phenomena, which is outside of this data set, but still in similar spirit, we don't have like hugely different text or lengths or anything, they are not handled. So that's very disappointing, right? Like we should be improving things and we should be remaining these basic levels of skills. So again, going to this question of what is progress, right? Like maybe here seeing this picture we are like oh we have made progress already with you know even with the smaller models we have made a big progress and then we are like oh oops but uh, actually our models can't handle this basic phenomenon at all or we look at okay here we improved slightly but suddenly we break the model's ability to handle basic skills so is that progress is is up to, I think, individual uh, interpretation. But I would say that we should be improving models in a way that doesn't break this kind of basic cells. And this is why that's why some of these, you know, just scaling and fine tuning approach can be a little bit disappointing because you don't have a control over this. Like you just have, you can fine tune and then check all of these things, but you don't have the ability to ensure that this will never be broken. It's really up to the model to decide once you start fine tuning it. Okay, are there any questions about this? Yes, please. 
Oh yeah. So um, so in this in this work by uh, uh, these folks, uh, they have defined uh, these uh, minimally functionality tests, and basically they uh, say, well, um, there are these dimensions or linguistic phenomena we care about. So we are going to produce these texts. Uh, uh, ex excuse me, examples for this test um, relative to this this uh, different phenomena. So here, temporal refers to the fact that these two questions differ in the time aspect. Here is, we have, uh, is this person currently an actress? And the second question is whether it's, you know, whether they have been uh, an actress in the past. Uh, so this just refers to how these two questions differ. And now co-reference and SRL is, uh, these are a specific um, NLP task we haven't talked about yet. Uh, but the here co-reference re is referring to uh, resolving uh, to who he or she refers to in text, whether he refers to Olivia or Donald, or whether she refers to Olivia or Donald. Um, this is how these two questions are differing. And um, yeah, SRL, it's, it's a little bit hard to explain, but SRL is, is a task where you want to determine who did what. So given a sentence, you want to determine that uh, if there is an action of trusting, Michelle is the person, an actor of the trusting operation, and uh, who this person trusts to is Angela, potentially. Um, so yeah, this just refers to how these questions are differing. So in the end, uh, if you have very low performance here, you can say, well, your model is seemingly very good, but it actually can't handle the, the temporal difference between questions, or it can't really handle coreference or passive active voice differences and stuff like that. So it gives you a little bit more interpretation of your results. Yeah, and there are way more than just these. Uh, I have just selected a few for these for the slide. They have over 50 of these tests. Other questions? Okay, so I'm going to leave you with that. Uh, we have learned about, you know, what we want to do, applications, what are tasks, what are data, benchmarks, and how tricky it is to have proper benchmarks and how tricky it is to ensure we are making a proper progress uh, on these things. And I've, I kind of chosen this topic right now because we have ended up on, you know, we came to the end of large language models and they kind of fix everything. and. Uh, this is really useful to have in mind when you see all of these improvements we are getting that, you know, um, the improvements have to be contextualized with respect to all of these potential confounders that, that ha might happen. Okay. Um, don't forget to submit the questions in the forum if you wish for me to cover anything special on uh, Monday. I will keep an eye uh, on those. And tomorrow is the deadline for the homework, which I, I'm sure you are aware of. <laughs>